I'm going to call. Because if he doesn't have the answer, he probably knows somebody who's going to get me that answer, and I'm going to be able to kind of interact with him that way. So you start thinking about how you want to be known in your career and being known in your own environment. Do you want to be known as the person who comes early? Do you want to be known as the person who delivers projects on time? Do you want to be known as that uh, the person who's always laughing at meetings or the person who just talks too much and never listens? You have to think on a general basis how you want to be perceived in your regular work environment, amongst your peers, and in the community at large. And it doesn't matter if you choose not to decide. You've still made a choice, to paraphrase an old song lyric. Um, you know, you have a brand. Whether you like it or not, you have a brand. It's only the choice of do you choose to consciously choose what your brand is and to work towards that brand, or do you choose to just let it happen? All right, next thing in managing your, your U Inc. is the one that nobody likes to talk about. And it's funny because, you know, you get these career talks with people like us, and everybody talks about how to get more income. But very few people would get up here and talk about the other side of it. But if you're running a company, you have a budget. You have a P&L, profit and loss statement. You have a balance sheet. Um, I, I'm a big fan of the financial guy, Dave Ramsey, and he often says, if you were hired by you, you Inc., to run, to run finance, if you ran finance for you the way you currently manage money, would you fire you? And I would bet the answer for most of us in the room is yes. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and give you a whole bunch of budget advice. Go, talk, go read Dave Ramsey or Susie Orman or something. But you don't just get to think about the income. You've got to think about the outgo, too. That's part of the P&L for you, Inc. Well, one of the key reasons that the outcome or how you budget and manage your life is important is because... If you're under financial duress, you cannot make good decisions. All your decisions will be colored because you have to focus on money as opposed to focusing on things that might be better for you. And, um, you know, Mike and I just, we just did that. We talked about that survey we pulled that data from beforehand. I mean, we found some things, and, and this will be easy. Just be show of hands. We're not going to ask anybody to say anything. So. We asked a couple key questions, and one of the questions we asked was, in relationship to other people in IT, do you think that have the same experience that you do, because you are a security professional, how many people believe that they're entitled to earn a bit more money? How many people think that they're entitled to earn a whole bunch more money? So it's a very small percentage right here. So in our survey, 50% of the respondents said that they felt that they were entitled to earn a bit more money. 33% of the respondents said that they were entitled to earn a lot more money. So 83% of the folks that responded to our survey thought that because they were a security professional, they deserved to earn more just because they did security. Unfortunately, How, most companies don't think that these that's, days. Yeah, I mean, I don't know any HR functions that think that way now. They used to, but not now. How many people think they're underpaid? Show of hands. How many people think they're overpaid? Okay. <laughs> A little honesty, right? So our survey said 60% of the information security professionals thought that they were underpaid. 3% said, thought that they were overpaid. That's about right in this room. So, <laughs> how many people got a salary increase last year? How many people were happy with their salary increase last year? Yeah, how that's many, about right. How many people were disappointed with their salary increase? Very good. 50% of the people in our survey were disappointed in their salary increase. And only 10% were pleasantly surprised. Five to one. So if you could, t I could tell you that the things that I saw in that survey made me feel one thing, just the common thread of the data, was that 
there's a perception problem in our market. And whether that perception problem is self-created or it's a poor job of management communication, it's one of those two things. So when you start thinking about compensation, what you really have to think about is how you mark yourself to the market. And when I say mark to market, we heard that a lot in the financial crisis. But when you start thinking about marking to market, right, how are you paid in relationship to others that have the same jobs, that have the same skills, in the same industry, in the same location. You have to find a way to get that data. Feel free to talk to your friends about some of these items. Question? And what that comes down to is ultimately customer selection. You know, if you're thinking about it as a business, when you start writing a business plan, you start talking about who your target market is and who your ideal customer is. You know, I know for one of my businesses that my ideal customer is the person that really cares about deep technical security. If someone's just looking to check a box, I don't want them as a customer, and I will turn them down. If you're working in, a, if if you want to be paid well as a as a security person, you probably want to work in an organization that cares and puts a whole lot of value towards security, right? It's, it, you know, and it it clears it up when you think about this as a customer relationship, because ultimately some customers are willing to spend a bunch of money on something and some aren't, and if your goal is to sell your product, at, if if you're selling a high price premium product, you know you're not marketing you're not marketing Ferraris to a low income you know, to a low-income neighborhood. You're marketing Ferraris to rich people. If you want to sell your product, which is you, at a very high price, you market it to people who have a lot of money to spend and who are looking to spend it on that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, when it comes down to it, too, one of the other things that, to, make, to, to expand upon your point, John, is that when you have... I mean, whose fault really is that information security is not valued in your organization? I mean, if that happens to be your situation, you might look at who's ever leading that organization at doing a very poor job of communicating to the people who determine the commitment, the budgets of information security by being able to demonstrate the importance, which goes back to sales. So if you think about that, right, you have to be able, in your job, you should be talking to your management about why security is important. I don't say that, hey, look, if we don't do this, the, you know, we're going to be on the cover of the New York Times and the building's going to, you know, we, the hackers are going to come in and we're going to lose our brand and all that other stuff. But you might be able to talk about that significantly and you might get more commitment. But, you know, when you start thinking about marketing your skills, right, you have to start thinking about, like, if I become better quicker, can I get more money? How will getting better help accelerate my earnings? In business, we call it a forecast. Right. I what mean, and, and the other thing is this. If I don't get better, are my skills worth less? I mean, think about, like, when people were, you know, in, when I started recruiting in the mid-'90s, if I found somebody who had had firewall experience checkpoint firewall experience that was real hot i mean i could people would pay tons of money for that now having firewall experience is like a sub is like it's expected that if you're a network engineer that you'll know how to deal with firewalls it's a you know it's an it's it's it, it's a it's a line item on the job it's not the job itself so if you think about that think about the skills that you're known for today what the market value of those skills are now and what the market value of those skills might be in three years. Is there going to be more need for those skills or are there going to be less need for your skills? And, and ultimately, you get to make choices about how your customers are going to pay you. Um, part of understanding your own financial situation is understanding 
how much compensation I need. Do I want to be a high-priced product right now, or will I take a little less while I develop that version 2.0? It's it's funny. We're we're a very education-driven industry, as we saw earlier. You know, the 47 percent want more training, and for only 49 percent want to keep their job. Um, most people in our industry will take less to be to develop their product more because it's a very product development oriented industry. You know, I, I always use accounting as my example. The rules of accounting haven't changed much in the last hundred years. The rules of information security, uh, you know, if you, were, if you still knew only what you knew in 2005, you would be completely useless to your employer. You, know, you wouldn't know anything about wireless networks, you wouldn't think about mobile devices, you wouldn't know about data leak prevention, uh, I could probably name. You probably 10 know other a lot about P PKI. Yeah, you know a lot about a lot PKI. About PKI. Um, you, but think about it. Our industry changes so rapidly. We're we're actually I, it, we're a funny industry because if you think about where the security holes are, they're always in the new product. There's not a whole lot of security holes in the products that were, you know that have been developed for 17 years. Actually, there was a great talk here yesterday on the NTLM nonce vulnerability that had been in every version of Windows, back to th Windows 3.51. How often does that happen? You very rarely hear of a vuln that goes back like 10 versions of a product because stuff gets worked out. So our industry always lives at the front of the threat vector. It always lives at the newest technology, which means you get obsolete real quick if you don't keep up. And I think the thing that you have to do is that when you start looking at your skills going back to that, is thinking about which skills you can leverage so you remain relevant and become more relevant. And those don't have to always be technical skills. A lot of them could be leadership and business skills. So I think it always kind of then comes back to, and this is one of my favorite quotes. You know, I don't even know the guy who said it, but I just think it's a great quote, right? It says, you know, you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. And I think there's some just general examples of talking about how you can negotiate better for yourself. And I mean, I think that the key component in negotiation is that everybody thinks it's an adversarial situation. Like when I deal with people, I'll say, well, well, what were you earning at your past job? And well, why does my client, why does your company need to know that? Well, they need to know that because they're going to be making some decisions. So you have to be able to start thinking of negotiation in a way where you're humanizing the discussions, where you're being, you're taking a very candid and professional approach to negotiation. You know, you're not going to be surprising, you know, your value of your skills is what your value of your skills are. And I think that what happens is this, is that a lot of people believe that there's these hidden myths in negotiation compensation where the best practices are really honesty. If you know you need a certain amount of money to take a job, you need to let people know that I need that amount of money to take the job. There really shouldn't be any surprises. And if you start thinking about your career goal and the business goal, if money is important to you, you have to figure out what that career goal really pays. Not what you saw on some website, not what, you know, some broad-based website puts out about, oh, yeah, if you're a security manager in New York City, you should be earning $200,000. That is completely not the case, but there's a ton of bad data out there. So you have to come with a good understanding of what these jobs pay, and if you know that you want to make $200,000 a year and you pick a career goal that's only going to max out about 125 or 130, you got a problem. You either have to adjust how you're living or you have to adjust your goal. So that goes back to that alignment, right? I mean, I also think this is that depending on where you are in your career, you're going to make different compensation decisions. I think that as a standard rule of thumb is that if you're early in your career, never take a job because of money. Always take a job because of experience, for acceleration, to work with smart people. Later in your career, your goals might change and money might be important. You might want to think about all those decisions that you've made along the way prepare you for a job where you can command larger compensation.